Hey everyone and welcome to this week's Digital Foundry Direct Weekly. We're putting this one out a little bit ahead of schedule really because of E3. We want to react to E3 in real time and so this one's going out just a bit before uh, E3 commences proper. And joining me to talk about E3, to sort of consider what we kind of hope to see, what we're expecting to see. First of all, John Linneman. Rich, how's it going? I'm ready to... This is a weird year. E3 is kind of back, kind of not. It's a little different, but I'm still excited. So uh, there's stuff to talk <laughs> yeah. about. <laughs> yeah, it's the it's the E3 that's kind of in E3 in name only. But uh, also joining us, of course, looking rather sexy into the bargain. Oh, it's oh, uh, yeah. Alex Vitali. <laughs> oh, I feel that. Jeez. Ooh. Um, yeah, I'm doing well this morning. Got my rice tea, which is very Ooh, rice tea. And, uh, so I talk about some E3. Yeah. <laughs> this is going to be a somewhat different direct. Usually we just talk about the news events of the week. Um, but because everything is sort of building up to E3, there is no news, really. I mean, I guess, I think, first of all, I mean, let's be clear. There is some news. We've got this uh, Battlefield reveal that happened for us yesterday. Uh, I'm not really sure what to make of it, really, uh, John. Oh man, I mean, I I kind of looked at it as like it's just like here's what people that loved Battlefield in the past think in their mind's eye Battlefield was probably like. No, it's just it, it really is just a cinematic looking trailer. I mean, um if it's intended to show some of the features of the current iteration of Frostbite, you know, aside from the fact that SSR is still being used, it does look pretty good overall, I'd say. Uh, but like fundamentally, I really don't like trailers like this that try to showcase f specifically for multiplayer games because multiplayer doesn't work this way. Nobody role plays in the way that they show in these trailers. They're not going to have all this fancy animation work for the multiplayer stuff. As far as I know, unless it's like some completely new take on multiplayer, but I've never seen it work before, so it is, it's just kind of a trailer for trailer's sake, and to me, not that different from like a CG render, even if it is intended to be in-engine, as they say. I guess the interesting thing from my perspective is that we did get some confirmations about aspects of the game's development, which, depending upon how you feel about the Battlefield series, uh, could be positive or negative. Um, for example, 128 player multiplayer, I think is the confirmed thing. Right? Isn't Do you understand the appeal of having such so many players? Because I feel like in these types of games, every time you get more people involved, it actually tends to get worse as far as like the play experience. Well, it depends on the game and the so for a game that has a lot of high level structures to like command structures like planet side, uh, these things uh, make sense actually. So that was one of the few multiplayer games I actually did enjoy, and yes, that actually made sense there. Yeah, so it can make sense, but the Battlefield series, at least since Battlefield 2, really hasn't had like a command structure that is so viable. So it tends to become a cluster F word uh, on a lot of maps. <laughs> there was some more persistence there or some kind of, like you said, like larger structure to it. It would make sense. But when you're just doing single matches, it just kind of feels pointless to me somehow. But whatever, people are happy. Clearly, this is not for us necessarily. But that's not necessarily for us. I guess another thing is, uh, as part of that trailer, I assume they're touching on things that will happen in game based upon, you know, like the Levolution events that have happened in Battlefield 4. Um, so it looks like there's going to be weather events that happen on certain maps and larger scale destruction. And the interesting thing for me was um, the sky rendering. I'm presuming they can't do that with just like 2D billboard clouds like huge cyclones and typhoons and things like that so maybe the next gen version of this game will also have some very cool cloud rendering but other than that you like you said john it's just like a cinematic trailer with animations and uh certain visual aspects that the game most definitely won't have uh, because it's a game <laughs> even though i'm not really into just multiplayer games like this uh i can respect them kind of Pot potentially going back to the roots like the series was built on multiplayer that's what it was about and they tried their hand at single player stuff they didn't do great work other than the visual side um i would have liked to have seen some new attempt at like revitalizing what single player battlefield could be 
I mean, imagine if like the Titanfall guys had said, you know what, Titanfall 1 is multiplayer, so we're just going to stick with that, and then we wouldn't have gotten one of the best campaigns of the generation. But whether or not DICE could have pulled it off, whatever. But still, like, for fans of classic Battlefield, it seems like they're moving in the direction that people really want, which is, uh, you know, that's great. I think people will be happy. But we have to wait and see the actual game. <laughs> Well, yeah, there's there's some I don't know what to other say. things. I, I don't really, I yeah. honestly just don't know what to make of these trailers. It's classic E3 where they show us something that visually is not really going to deliver in the final game. I think that's pretty clear. I mean, so what is the point? I mean, to be fair, there is sort of a least consistency here. Dice did it with Battlefront and uh, Battlefront Two. Uh, usually, before a gameplay reveal, they have what is effectively a CG reveal. But what annoys me is that, that you know, it's like, oh, it's uh, in-engine footage, which is another sort of classic E3 trope, which um, uh, actually we got a question here, which uh, I think we can answer at this point uh, from Eric Hurst. He's, <laughs> he says, uh, got into a squabble with someone on Twitter. Well, don't we all? And was was wondering if you could shed some light. If a trailer for a game claims to be made of in-engine footage, does this mean that the game was captured in real time or could it be pre-rendered? What difference would it make visually? Specifically, what do you think we saw in the Battlefield uh, 2042 revealed trailer? So, you know, this is a really interesting question because um, essentially EA and DICE have put this trailer out and people don't know whether it's real or not. And, uh, you know, I, I guess I'd like to hear your, your guys' definition of in-engine footage. But basically, my definition is that um, the engine, the Frostbite engine, was used to deliver that trailer. But there is no guarantee, and almost certainly not, that it's real time or that the game will actually look like that. But it may be using assets from the game. We're in an era where engines are now being used in, like, TV and movie production ways right like people are making things with these engines that are not intended to be displayed in real time and that's not to say like assets and stuff and some of the things being shown can't exist in the game of course but what makes that such a cool impressive piece is just the quality of the animation work and just like the the granularity of everything happening and especially for a multiplayer game the chance of anything being like that seems very low to me and not really representative of what the game will look like in action. In engine for me, uh, my experience with working with uh, or loading things up in game engines and trying them out, uh, there's ability to render out frames at distinct time step intervals uh, and render them into movie files usually. Uh, most engines have this Unreal CryEngine had it back all the way in like 2007, uh, even before then. Uh, and that is what they're using 100% when they say an engine. So they're setting up cameras and stuff in the engine uh, and then just rendering them out, even though the scene may actually run in real time, probably at like two or three FPS. That's totally what they're doing. Uh, I don't find it very nice at all. <laughs> I, it doesn't excite me. Like when I saw that trailer the other day, all I kept was just thinking like, the game's not going to look like this. So when you see an engine, I don't know, Warner Brother, it's it's not real. They didn't say that this was gameplay. And also, based on the reaction to people, it obviously worked from a marketing standpoint. So a lot of folks seem pretty stoked by it, um, which is, uh, you know, we're, it just kind of takes me right. It's not quite the same, but it just takes me right back to the E3 2005 with the PlayStation 3. People flipping out and going nuts. Oh, my gosh. Did you see Motorstorm? Did you see... Kill zone is just like it kill zone. Not the same thing exactly, because those really were just completely unrelated offline CG renders. But it's that same like here's this improbable thing happening on the screen. Uh man, doesn't that look exciting? <laughs> yeah, so I guess we have to wait until um I think it's Sunday that we get to see the actual footage. I'm sure it'll um, look great. But, you know, that's the thing. I'm sure yeah, yeah I'm sure uh, it'll look great, yeah. but um I guess the other thing is, uh, I think you kind of touched on it there, John, is that it's actually really difficult to show a multiplayer game looking exciting in a in a format that's digestible as a trailer. Yeah, that's um, yeah, that's yeah, because you know if you're going to do a trailer of like Warzone or PUBG or whatever, you know, and, and if it was representative of the gameplay, there'd be a lot of sort of wandering about. See, I feel like to make those trailers <laughs> work, in quarters. you kind of need to be hopping or find a way to hop around between different viewpoints. Obviously, be, make it kind of scripted, like a, a play a game with the developers, like set it up, 
try to do all these special actions, show different viewpoints of things that are possible in the game. I mean, there's ways to make an interesting trailer, but it's definitely more difficult than like single player. Yeah, you know, but it, it just kind of gives me flashbacks to all of the E3 disappointments in the past where it's like, oh, great, we're going to see this fantastic new game and you end up not seeing it. Um, obviously, in this case, we will end up seeing it because there is apparently a gameplay reveal coming. But um, it's just this kind of weird sort of thing that seems to be peculiar to the games industry where you know you can put out an asset that bears no relation to the actual game and apparently it's marketing and again you know the the games industry loves to compare itself to the movie industry and the parallel there would be you know uh, a low budget sort of um, movie you know they bring in ILM to do uh, the effects just for the trailer to produce something that is in no way representative of the final final movie just wouldn't happen and um, you know I'm just kind of I don't know, just concerned that, um, that that we're sort of stuck in a rut here because, you know, the bottom line is we're reaching the point now, I mean, we, we covered Ratchet and Clank uh, this week where it's to the point now where you don't need to fake game visuals. Ratchet and Clank in real time on PS5 is holding up beautifully against a 2016 pre-rendered movie with like infinite compute resources thrown at it. Um, so what's the point? Just stop it. If you haven't got anything to show, don't show it. That's that's the thing is it's like, you know, uh, you'd think companies would look at usually when a company showcases a hype piece before the game is actually ready to show, it almost always comes back to bite them in the butt, right? Like it never goes well. Uh, well, it usually doesn't go well. So it's like, you know, maybe wait to reveal the game. You could say, hey, it's in development. Uh, but like, it doesn't make sense to hype up something that's not ready to be shown necessarily. And it's better to kind of, it seems like companies have had better luck by compressing their hype cycles, like say revealing a game that's like less than a year away and then kind of showing what it could be. And then there's a lot of, there's realism there in terms of expectations and it kind of doesn't, it doesn't allow it to fade out of the public consciousness but that's the thing with this uh, Battlefield thing is they're about to show real gameplay. The game is coming out this year uh, and they still open up with a hype video. So I don't know. <laughs> Let's talk about what I think is going to be uh, the sort of major kicking off point for this uh, E3, which will be the Microsoft. Oh, yeah. Slash Bethesda conference. Bethesda. Um, so much to potentially talk about here. Uh, stuff to get it genuinely excited about, I think. Uh, so, John, what are you looking forward to? Well, so one of the big things I'm hoping for is uh, I would like to see Halo Infinite reemerge. Um, you know, it's been a while since that last showing. Uh, I feel like they're not going to come back to show the game until like they feel like they have something that's going to impress people or like really look exciting and interesting. Um, because, yeah, it's it's an important series and I'm kind of glad that they've got the extra time that they need to finish it up properly. And it's actually kind of fitting because if it comes out this fall, then it would have been exactly like 20 years since Halo 1 versus last year where it would have been like 19 years. So it's like it's just on that that 20th anniversary. Um, so I'm expecting them hopefully to kind of roll out with a new look at the game. Maybe it'll be a campaign thing, but it could also be like multiplayer stuff. But it's really hard to say. Uh, either way, I hope it comes out looking great. I'm crossing my fingers for those guys. Uh, also, I'm wondering, do you think we'll see something like Starfield at last? Because there's been a lot of buzz about that. It kind of feels like something that Microsoft would want to open or really like show. But then again, like the thing about Xbox conferences in the past is they always have a lot of really awesome announcements, but they they really lean heavily into the CGI teaser stuff. And I'm a little bit afraid that the reaction to Halo Infinite last year when they actually did show the game is going to make them become even more conservative as far as showing the games. And this is interesting because in comparison, Bethesda has been usually fairly good about showing their games, at least the ones that are close enough to release where you do get some like more look at the gameplay. So uh, like when Todd Howard came out for the Fallout thing, obviously they went nuts just showing all kinds of stuff. And I'm kind of hoping that you know, it opens up and you see that uh, that silhouette of Todd Howard walk out again. And although I actually don't know what the presentation will be like since it's online, but um, 
I would love to see something from that. Very curious. And anything else? Starfield. Starfield has got to be there. It has to be, to be right? There. And That's... I really wouldn't be surprised if they opened with it uh, because, mm-hmm. you know, fundamentally Microsoft is uh, really sort of um, stressing the association with Bethesda and even in the way they're marketing the press uh, event. It's, you know, it's Xbox slash Bethesda. And um, I think to open with this would be the way forward. And here's the, here's the other thing, of course, is that um, uh, we're talking about sort of real, real uh, versus sort of uh, pre-rendered or fake assets. Um, the thing that Microsoft can do is, you know, they're not specifically wedded to Xbox hardware. There's no reason at all why they can't show games running on a high-end PC as long as, you know, as long as it's disclosed. At least then we're actually seeing something real, even if it is requiring a lot of <laughs> a lot of compute power to deliver it. But at least it's something tangible. I feel like and they've real. been pretty good about that in the past, if I recall. Like, I think like Flight Simulator was at one of these things before, and they were very clear, like, yeah, this is PC right here. Although, hey, maybe we'll actually see Flight Simulator on Series X or something, because that would be a quite a, a sh- visual showcase for that system. Yeah. There's lots of rumors about it. Rumors, indeed, that it could actually be released very soon, which seems a bit unlikely to me. That would be a nice surprise thing. I was also thinking the same thing for, like, um, as an aside, they could, like, have uh, id Software roll out, like, hey, here's the Doom Eternal next-gen patch. Uh, We got ray tracing on Xbox. Uh, Maybe we got, like, 120 frames per second, if that was a thing in there. You know, just, like, and it's available right now. Like, that would be cool. That would be a fun kind of bonus thing to add in there for a solid game. Yeah. I mean, I think at this point, uh, Microsoft, uh, it's time for them to come good with some of the investments they've made. And they've made a lot. Um, <laughs> and they've made a lot of investments and I suspect they're not done. I suspect we might even see some announcements of new studio acquisitions at E3, uh, which um, which I'm really excited about. But, you know, what have Playground Games been up to since Forza Horizon 4? We know they're doing they're doing Fable, but that's, as I understand it, a separate development studio within... Um, well, yeah, so so what are, what is the Forza Horizon that's team That's the thing, doing? though, Rich. How does it relate to you, motorsport? Do you think they would show a Horizon and a motorsport at the same thing? Because it also sounds like the motorsport guys, they kind of walked away from Forza 7, like, we need to make a big change to the series. And it has been a while. It's take, they've been given more time than usual to work on the next game. So maybe they have something new to show there that's like sort of shaking up that series. They already showed off a teaser last time of, um, you know, ray tracing and stuff like that in their engine. So maybe we'll see a bit more of that. Personally, I'm hoping to see in terms of Bethesda stuff, I want to see the Indiana Jones game. Even just a teaser from Machine Games because we haven't seen an Indiana Jones game since... I don't know. What was that game that was canceled? It was the one for PS360 uh, with the physics in it. Yeah. Uh, that's it. That, that, was like, that was the LucasArts game, yeah, right? Yeah, that was one of the last ones. So, I think there was also that was the there last was one, one for uh, Nintendo Wii <clears throat> that also came with the Fate of Atlantis point-and-click game, so you could play it with the Wii mode. Oh, did it really? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. And it wasn't too bad. Well, that, I can't that, remember the name. It was like, that's, oh, I, I forget the name, but I have it. It's not bad. I can't remember that one. But it's been a while since we've seen Indiana Jones, and I love the movies, and I think the, the writing chops that uh, Machine Games has shown in at least uh, The New Order are really, really high, and they could do it really, really well. Uh, so I'd really love to see that, and I guess, um, I don't know. Starfield is interesting to me, too. You know, space games, I always love those. Uh, it's just a matter of seeing, like, demonstrating Starfield is probably very hard, and it would require, I imagine, like a long form presentation uh, because it's an RPG. I mean, I could see them just doing what they did for Fallout 4, basically, which they came out and they really showcased all the new features and concepts and what the game means. And they did a really good job with that presentation, I think. So I suspect we could see that again. Uh, but I, it's it's interesting. What about, um, I don't know, what what's that game from uh, Arcane? Uh, Deathloop, which... That's on the way. I'm very interested in that game, but it's in this weird position of having that first launch in PS5. So it's like, can they show it at this thing? Like, I, I'd be like, I wonder how the team feels about that. It's like, oh, we want to show our game, but we can't because it's, uh, you know, we'll see. Yeah. 
It's an interesting one, that. Uh, yeah, I, I'm. well, here we go. I mean, as far as I know, Sony aren't really doing anything at E3. There's no major press event. So this is like a, a massive opportunity for Microsoft. And um, uh, I'm just super excited for it. Because Hellblade 2 could be another one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they've got, you know, they've got Bethesda. They've got um, Ninja Theory. They've got Playground Games. Uh, they've got Turn 10. They've got 343. They've got the coalition. You know, we've we've had this announcement from the coalition that they're going to be using UE5. Maybe, you know, maybe we will see some sort of demo or whatever. Uh, something else I'd really like to see, perhaps it's a bit outside of the remit of an E3 press conference. But um, I honestly feel that Microsoft needs to um, kind of stress the technological capabilities of the Series X and the fact that it is different from PlayStation 5 and it has features that PlayStation 5 doesn't have. And we know that there's R&D happening uh, with stuff like um, AI upscaling. I think there's, you know, they always have a little corner within an E3 press conference where they say, hey, we've got this really good tech that's, uh, that's coming. Uh, look out for it. So I'm really hoping we get to see something um, that, that sort of flexes the muscles of the Series X uh, in a way that's, I mean, maybe it's just digital Valtteri fan service, but I'd like to see it. Um, but yeah, basically, I think the stars are in alignment for Microsoft with this one. They don't really have any um, competition in terms of the enormity of this press event. They've got all of these studios. They've got all of these titles. Um, they've got Game Pass as well, which, you know, the importance of which we can't understate. Um, we suspect there's more studio acquisitions. So this is going to be like, you know, gig gigaton stuff. Forget the megatons. Hopefully, we're looking at gigatons here. And I kind of sort of uh, thinking, hopefully, that you know, when this direct goes out publicly, it's going to be like a few hours before Microsoft kick off. So I'm kind of hoping that our predictions pan out here and it doesn't fall flat. But certainly, all of the components are in place. Yes, they this have the potential really to blow one. the doors off things here. Uh, <laughs> it's up to them whether they do it or not. <laughs> Is there any sort of other events that you're looking forward to? What about Nintendo? Because this has been a really interesting kind of... Um, they've, they've kind of set out to, I wouldn't say lower expectations for their E3 showing, but they really are kind of hinting heavily that we're not going to see anything on uh, Switch Pro. So what do you make of that, John? Um, I suspect we're going to see a lot of Zelda stuff. Uh, you know, they have Skyward Sword coming up, the H or remaster they have. Breath of the Wild 2 still to talk about. They they may have other like Zelda like remakes or you know they haven't brought those those uh Wii U games over to to Switch yet, so there's always a chance of that. Um things like that, like I suspect all of that. Uh I wouldn't expect necessarily any updates on like say Metroid Prime 4 yet, unfortunately, because you know, just following that development it feels like it's not ready. Uh, there has been all, what, hasn't there been like rumors about some kind of new Donkey Kong game from the Nintendo, uh, th from Nintendo itself, which could actually be really interesting. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think we're going to see any necessarily big things from Nintendo at this show, but you know, it's worth keeping an eye on. Uh, they'll, they'll announce new switch hardware when they're good and ready, I suppose. Yeah, I'm I'm still I'm still sort of pondering about this whole Switch Pro thing because there is still the two schools of thought. One is that we're going to get this full on next gen Switch. The other is that it's basically the existing Switch with an OLED screen. And um nothing that Nintendo has said rules out the latter option as far as I can see. They said they're going to be demonstrating um Switch games and those Switch games would run exactly the same on a Switch Pro that was just a screen upgrade. Um, so I wonder whether there might be some sort of um, stealth hardware reveal. Um, but, you know, I honestly think in the current situation with uh, cutting edge semiconductor supplies, it's just physically not possible to launch a new next generation console this year and certainly not get any kind of volume out of it. I also happen to think that the Switch is still selling really well. Um, I don't think it's, um, I think it's possibly reaching its peak in terms of, of, of the generation. Um, but I don't think they actually need to reveal a new Switch at this point. Um, a screen upgrade and, you know, some kind of deluxe model, possibly. Beyond that, well, I think they've got at least another year before the, the sense is that uh, the Switch is starting to feel old and past it. But, you know, I don't know. 
I guess one thing is usually um, we would have, a, if it was a, a Switch Pro reveal where it's more than just an OLED, but it's actually like a different hardware lineup internally, uh, we haven't from NVIDIA side, at least in a while, heard about their mobile offering and what, uh, you know, last time they grabbed, you know, Nintendo grabbed like an off the shelf chip and brought it in, uh, into the Switch. Uh, but this time we don't actually know what NVIDIA has going on behind the scenes. Uh, in terms of their architectures and how it lines up with their mobile offering. So it would be a really big surprise for me just to even hear anything about the hardware. I wouldn't actually know where to start. Yeah, um, the hardware side of things, I actually think that there's a great deal of potential for them to actually do a custom chip, because if you look at the mobile offerings, they're basically designed for um, in-car entertainment systems and, of course, this kind of self-driving uh, stuff. So while I do think that there is some potential crossover there, it's I think those chips are being engineered for very different things than the Tegra X1 was engineered for. I mean, if we go back to Tegra X1 2015, you know, NVIDIA are actually trying to sell their own console at that point with that silicon. That's not what Tegra is about these days. So I would expect to see a custom chip for a new uh, for a new Nintendo offering, and certainly the R&D budgets would be there for it because the Switch is now a proven concept. It wasn't um, back in the day. But uh, yeah, certainly exciting, but I would be surprised to see anything huge uh, at this E3. Um, so let's talk about other stuff that's potentially happening. Um, I don't know. I mean, where else do we go from here? I guess then um, we've got Square Enix, I think. Maybe we'll see more Final Fantasy 16 on a PS5 because they kind of announced that a while ago and it kind of feels like a big thing that they would show at an E3. I mean, they may have other things in the works, uh, you know, more remakes of things or like lower scale like they did with um, uh, Seiken Densetsu last year and the year before. So I don't know, maybe we'll see something like that. And because it's Square Enix, that also means you could see stuff from their other studios. Like they were, wasn't it the Americans, like, wasn't there an American studio or something? I don't know. There's a new Final Fantasy that was rumored to be coming out that is like an origin story. Oh, that story. thing. Uh, who is uh, oh, that? Yeah, thing. I what was that? forget. I'm blanking. I, I think it was Western Development. I don't though. remember if it is or not, uh, but there is, okay, there is yeah. something else. Something like that. Um, And then what about like, you know, Crystal Dynamics and them? I mean, they just released Avengers, of course, but isn't there another, like, isn't there like a like the Square Enix in Montreal like doing something with superheroes? Well, <laughs> it's a little hard to keep my my finger on all the buttons. <laughs> Too many of those. Um, I guess another one. I guess we have to talk about EA a little bit. Uh, Dragon Age, where which was recently, I think, uh, I think it was a tweet by Jason Schreier or Schreier, however you pronounce his name. Um, uh, sorry about that, Jason. Um, essentially describing that Dragon Age is no longer going to be a uh, kind of microtransaction season model based multiplayer add on kind of orientated game, but they're going to keep it wholly based. Wait, on I didn't realize content, it was going to be is... that. That sounds like an absolute nightmare. Why would you <laughs> ever want to make that? Oh my know. gosh. Ugh. <laughs> because. I mean, there's the historical uh, inertia for games like that. I guess even even kind of going back to Mass Effect 3 days, there was a hot, heavier push towards multiplayer and DLC content. Uh, so uh, it's not unknown. No, I know. It's just I would say for taking a titles. franchise like uh, that that's already has an audience and say, yeah, we're going to turn into this mobile garbage that... No, I'm just <laughs> some people love that stuff. I know. Yeah. It's just take, taking a series yeah. that is already founded in one style and completely... Oh changing it would have been a bad idea and it sounds like they're not doing it so no no offense yeah, to people that love that, playing mobile games it's uh that's, that's cool yeah i guess the one thing that would be exciting about that for me is we haven't seen frostbite in a title like a newer title since almost was like we saw anthem and then we had uh the new uh, rogue squadron game uh but we haven't seen anything targeting next gen uh necessarily We'll be seeing Battlefield soon enough, but I would love to see uh, what features Frostbite has been. Uh, you know, we haven't seen it really upgraded super hot to high tech uh, concerns targeting new uh, new consoles. So I'd love. I'm to sure see Battlefield that. will be the uh, one but, that shows cases at anything yeah. that would make sense. Although unrelated mm -hmm. to EA, but yeah. it just reminded me of the project that Remedy is working on that they announced. Um, oh yeah, is that actually called Crossfire? 
like Crossfire uh, X Crossfire or something. Single player campaign. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like yeah, that was looking hey, really good. That was like running at 60 FPS on Xbox One X. Wow. Well, mm-hmm. I'd be curious so, to see if that reemerges in any form. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's been a while. It was I think it was partially delayed a, a while back, but it would be interesting to see them too because last time we saw it, we saw it running the the console version of the graphics and they just brought out control at that point almost uh, like a little bit before then and uh you know they they are pushing ray tracing super hard and it'd be interesting to see what iteration they've made on that um yeah so i guess uh this sort of rounds up our existing thoughts uh, our preview thoughts about e3 um so let's move on to the next topic this week um john you revealed your ratchet and clank uh megan magnum opus and it was an awesome <laughs> video and um kind of followed up from what we were talking about last week about how sony has uh, seemingly shifted a bunch of its first party titles into cross-gen status um first of all i'm just astonished by ratchet it's just it's just everything i want from a next generation title and i'm sure alex is hugely excited by just how much raid facing stuff they managed to get into the final game that, still some unexplained things there. I really do wonder how they did it. Like the doubling the resolution thing. That's not easy. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it is just the, the fact that, you know, basically uh, PlayStation 5 is running with PlayStation, uh, with raid facing hardware that is, you know, significantly less capable than any AMD GPUs that's out there. And um, that just to get those results from so little silicon resource, I think is just absolutely phenomenal. Um, and it does kind of put into perspective the whole cross-gen thing and it just sort of serves to highlight the disappointment, I think, um, that a lot of key first-party titles are moving on to um, being cross-gen rather than actually targeted at next-gen. I think actually going back to Battlefield, just for one minute, they do actually have different um, kind of feature sets and targets for the individual platforms, uh, for the individual generations, which I think is a positive step forward. Um, there's the sense there that the um, the kind of limita- limiting factors of the last gen systems are at least being mitigated by giving the developers a bit more room to to shine on next gen. But John, you actually put out a really interesting tweet here, which was, hold on a minute, how many next gen only games are there? Uh, you know, because we're like, what, six months, seven months into the generation now. And the list is surprisingly small, right? Yeah, so I kind of put that out there. I wasn't really looking for too much of a discussion as to what next gen means, you know, what all all this kind of, there's a lot of discussion to be had around this. I just wanted to find as best as I could the number of games that only exist that you can only purchase as a product on one one or the other or both uh new consoles. And it can also exist on the PC, of course. But uh I found 10 games there may actually be more. It's hard to say. Uh, and 11 if, if uh, well, let's go through it. So in alphabetical order then, the first one is a game called Aliens that I'd never heard of. It's what? unrelated to the films. It is this random <laughs> thing, and apparently it's really bad. Uh, but I, I don't want to say one way or another because I have not tried it. But it, that is apparently next-gen only. Uh, the other one then wow. that I had never heard of but actually looks like kind of awesome is an airport for aliens currently run by dogs, which apparently is only available for the Xbox Series consoles and the PC, I think, as well on Steam. Yeah. So there's that. But, um, but it's not really a looker. I mean, unless no. you like stock, stock JPEGs. And dogs. again, like I said, this is not about how it looks. This is not about, you know, any yeah. of this stuff. This is just, is this product only available on next gen? These two, yes. Uh, then there's Astro's Playroom, which again, that... There's there's debate as to whether that's a full game. I mean, there's a decent amount there, but it's it is PS5 only, and that actually ties into the next game, which is Bright Memory 1.0, uh, for Xbox Series X and PC, which is similar to Astro's Playroom in that it's kind of like uh, it's it's relatively constrained. It's like a, a slice of of something larger. There's some cool stuff there, but that's also there only. Uh, then there's Demon Souls, which uh, seems to have upset a lot of people because they claim it's the same as the PS3 game. Uh, regardless of whether you think that, like the sheer the amount of work and time and years that Bluepoint put into making it and the fact that it is a, a unique product, I, I think that's a, 
I think that counts. <laughs> who, who, who said that? A lot of who, people. Uh, what? They were they were very angry about it, and they uh, insisted that it's just the PlayStation Three game. And how dare you put that on that list? But for sure, this is our list. It's going on there. Uh, <laughs> then there's one that I had forgotten about, which is Destruction All Stars. Which okay, it was fine. Um, that was actually the first next gen game we had ever heard about. I think it was like three years ago. There was like some talk like, hey, this studio is doing something. We're like, hmm, what could that be? It's Destruction All-Stars. Uh, then there's something called Enlisted. Yeah, this is which, a PC game primarily, though. Like, yeah, but it's also on down. only on the consoles as well. Like in terms of it's not you can't get it on PS4 and Xbox One. Mm -hmm. uh, not too familiar with it, though. But it's a, I think it's a large multiplayer uh world war ii game and uh, so really large multiplayer and also ue4 if i recall and ue4 does not scale very well on poor uh cpus to say the least uh then we have the medium for xbox which i looked at earlier this year which is a, a cool little game and it's got very nice visuals on display it's also really heavy on the pc for some reason uh not sure what's going on there but uh there it is and that that does showcase some neat features and that has like the dual world thing and with the two viewports, which is, you know, expensive, a bit cool. Uh, then there's Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, obviously, which we've talked a lot about this week. And then there's Returnal from Housemark, which is also really impressive, beautiful game, you know, uh, and then arguably you could put Godfall on that list, but there are suggestions that apparently it is coming to PS4 and possibly other last-gen systems, that's not confirmed. So currently, technically, that would make this list 11 games, but it sounds like that is going to go elsewhere. Uh, so, and there may be one or two. I mean, the fa I didn't know about Aliens or an airport for Aliens. Wow, just, what the heck? An airport for Aliens currently run by dogs and Aliens. Uh, maybe they're connected. It's like the Aliens cinematic From universe. But... Um, <laughs> Yeah, like there may be other small titles, but it's by this count, there's basically just 10 games only. I'm not saying anything about what that means or anything here. It's just an interesting observation. And it's something that uh, we've never seen before. This has not happened before. <laughs> I'm just thinking about like the paltry lineup of games that the Nintendo 64 had when it launched, but it kind of grew rather quickly. Well, and everything on there was exclusive for that. And uh, we're we're in a different t period, of course. I mean, the way game development is these days, things are hardware isn't shifting so dramatically, and there is le you know things are more scalable. So I can understand the need for it. It's just it's a fascinating thing to see because we've never been in this situation where new consoles are out for like six months, and nearly every single game is available on older platforms as well um and as far as like big marquee platform titles i mean you know you get the medium on xbox which was pretty big for them and then there's uh how many is it like four ps5 one two three four five i guess technically but ps5 those, games that are only ps5 like there's, there's like two though that were huge i would say like ratchet is gonna be huge it's gonna be massive and then demon souls at launch was everyone wanted to know about Demon's Souls, but Returnal is more like a, I would say, sleeper hit. You know, it's a little bit smaller. So I don't know, what do you think about this, Rich? Like, you, you've been around long enough, you've done this stuff, have you seen this kind of thing before? Uh, no, um, because basically console generations were defined as console generations in the way that Sony tried to define a console generation vis-a-vis -vis PlayStation 5, which is kind of... I do think it, um, that kind of um, statement is sort of unraveling. A it's bit it's a weird bit. because they clearly started out with that intention based on this list, but uh, it seems like they must have decided, you know what, we better make, we got to make back this uh, money. <laughs> I don't know. I actually don't know what went into the decision, but yeah, it is what it is. Well, you know, the, the stated objective was to move people from PlayStation 4 to PlayStation 5 as quickly as possible. I mean, they were public about that. And it's clear with the stock shortages that there's just a logistical barrier to making that happen. I suspect that that's a very deep reason as to why we're seeing this now, because like people just can't get these machines and they can't make enough. So Yeah, but at the same time, you know, 
I'd still say that they've shifted more PlayStation 5s than they have PlayStation 4s in the same period. And, you know, they dropped the PS3 like a hot potato at the same time <laughs> during the last, the last generation. And rightfully so, you know, because um, it's paid off for them. And the, the quality of first party uh, exclusives and the kind of feeling that you're buying into a new generation of gaming, that you're seeing things that you haven't seen before. Um, you know, looking at that list, uh, Ratchet and Clank, that is basically delivering. That is delivering the, everything that you'd want from a next generation experience, visually, um, conceptually, uh, in terms of exercising the hardware. They're doing some phenomenal things there. And, you know, this is next gen, and, and this is kind of what we need to see. Returnal is, I'd say, it's possibly a smaller scale project, but it's, again, you couldn't run that game on a PlayStation 4 and get the same kind of experience. I suspect what would happen on PS4 is if, besides reducing the visual quality, they'd probably, uh, there'd be like loading points between doors, kind of like Metroid Prime style. You know, it's like, oh, you got to wait for the next biome or next area to load so the door doesn't, like, maybe they do an animation. And, you know, even like the concept of Ratchet could could be made to work on a PS4. It's just that the way they're actually doing it wouldn't work. Like those mid-level switches, it's just too much data to move around. And people are like, oh, just put in loading times. But like when you switch dimensions like 10 times within a minute, uh, loading times would, would destroy that. So you'd have to rethink that out entirely i think and i even think uh, astro astro's playroom you know um a key part of the messaging in the lead up to the playstation 5 launch was the dual sense controller and how it's going to be game changing and i honestly think uh, astro's playroom still pretty much the only game changer in terms of control that you know where i think wow this is actually instrumental to the uh, to the experience, and I actually think um, uh, uh, the kind of haptics have, have been, you know, the resistive triggers in particular. I actually find in some cases make games less enjoyable. Oh man, um, the worst know, if, for me was pu- Dirt Five. Man. A, yeah, I mean, if I'm pulling a trigger, I don't really want to have massive resistance. Uh, yeah. just because it maybe feels notionally more realistic no, it just see, doesn't work for me that, that's what i like dirt 5 i love that game but i turn that stuff off because like by default they made the resistance so strong that it's actually just like annoying like you you're thinking about the pressure on your finger the entire time and it's a different move than pushing a gas pedal on a car where you're essentially using gravity to to put the weight down on the pedal where here you're like pulling your finger in the whole time and it's it's not very comfortable because you hold that down the entire time. It's like going back and trying to play uh, like Connect Sports Rivals with like that jet ski game. Like, hey, this works really well. But then you realize holding your arms out like a steering wheel for or like for, like you're holding the handles for that long. It's not actually very comfortable or fun. The one that I found and you you mentioned it, John, too. I didn't in Returnal. Uh, I was not so excited about the fact that I could feel raindrops in the controller itself or something like that. But uh, you mentioned like the alternative fire mode uh, was, you know, that, the, the, but that doesn't really necessarily use the, the haptic feedback function so much as the fact that it turns the trigger into a dual trigger. Uh, is that even possible on the Xbox? Do we know? Can the Xbox do a dual trigger functions? I don't even know. No, well, no, because uh, there's no, it's just, there's no motor there. Uh, what the, I mean, that concept's nothing new though. Like I said, that's what GameCube has where, It's literally a button beneath there. So you pull the trigger down and then at a certain point it clicks into a button. So they they physically implement that into the controller where here it's doing it using motors. But, you know, same idea. I guess the thing that's disappointing is like we've talked about all the Sony stuff. But actually, if you look back at like Xbox launches, like those have been so those had previously been focused on blowing people away, like out of the gate with very impressive new. You can only do this on this console moments. I mean. The original Xbox, you had Halo, Dead or Alive 3, stuff like that, Project Gotham, like that stuff looked incredible at the time, and Halo itself was just phenomenal. And then 360 comes along, Project Gotham Racing 3 was like unlike any other, like the motion blur, the quality of the models, it was unbelievable. Not the best game, but like, you know, Perfect Dark Zero uh, showcased like parallax occlusion maps and all kinds of very impressive new techniques that hadn't been seen before. Uh, and then even Xbox One, you know, for all the, all the, all the the bad, I guess, word of mouth that it had early on, it actually had some pretty nice looking stuff at launch. I mean, Rise looked incredible for that system. It was, 
it was great. I mean, Forza Motorsport 5, you know, say what you will about it. It was an attractive 1080p 60 game. Uh, and even Dead Rising 3, not not necessarily a, a stunner, but, you know, it, it, it was it was a cool looking well, sequel. They were, they were aiming to do something new with it. Yeah, yeah they tried to do some new things thing. with it. And it even had stuff yeah. like uh, glass and debris that would shatter based on uh, your momentum. So, you know, you run into something that shatters correctly versus you know just hitting it like they were trying to do some cool new things but then you get to xbox series x which i would say is probably the best engineered console they've ever made and it's extremely capable but there's not like they just launched with a bunch it's xbox one games that are enhanced for the series x they didn't do anything like the last generations and i don't know i that's a i know things are different but it is a a little disappointing to see it is pretty disappointing mm. to see. Um, yeah. Yeah. Interesting stuff, though. And um, I don't know. I'm just kind of curious to see what the next next generation only game is going to be. And possibly we'll see something at E3. I'm not I'm not sort of holding my hopes up, though, because, um, you know, it just seems to be the case that um, uh, both of the new generation of um, machines have um, delivered what is essentially uh horsepower upgrades over the last generation but you know the gpus fundamentally have a lot of similarities and uh, this is again this, this is again why i really want to see microsoft um, sort of showcase um, all of the effort they put into the dare i say it bespoke stuff that's in the silicon uh, because you know we haven't had a huge amount on that so far yeah like people are impressed with what series X is doing right now. But if you actually like look at what the hardware can actually do, like what's really in there, what the stuff that Richard and I saw last year, it's like, there is, there's a lot of potential there that I think people just haven't seen yet. And it's just waiting to be tapped and I'm sure we'll see it at some point, but we're waiting. I just, I just keep thinking about that. You guys <laughs> saw Minecraft running yeah, with path tracing, like, yeah. like how long before the console launch and we're just sitting here and that's just why that's made did, that like, code that should no have idea. been that should have been at launch like yes it's minecraft but like path trace minecraft is unbelievable looking it looks amazing like, I why, do have what, a why? Yeah. i do have a theory My, you know uh, as we saw with minecraft rtx um dlss was key to that really working and maybe it's simply the same thing happening on uh, Series X where they're waiting for their AI upscaler technology to, to actually be shippable. And it should actually produce awesome results with that kind of uh, material. You're right. But at the same time, like the build we saw, it was very early development, clearly not something intended to be shipped. And it was already like uh, well over 30 FPS running on that thing, you know, so I feel like they could have optimized it further and really done something cool at launch and you know but again it's fine it's it's all past we know where things are going and now obviously uh we're moving forward and they have a chance to showcase i think like a, an inch i don't think they'd do it but like a a strong punch from them would be to come back show halo infinite and it looks really great and also kind of say hey this is now just a next gen game <laughs> you know, we would all love like, that John. basically do the opposite everyone should have a dream john <laughs> oh, I, know, no. I know i don't think that's gonna happen no um i'll tell you something else that i want um from e3 while we're sort of uh sort of skirting around that subject um i'd love to see surprise demo drops oh i love it used to happen lost they planet never, they never seem to happen anymore lost, yeah lost yeah. planet is the classic one that was awesome, um, man. But, you know, we're kind of, everybody is kind of detached from E3. There's n there's no way to get hands on with code at the moment. And uh, I'd love to see something there, something, you know, some kind of event, you know, you sort of see the thing up on stage and it's like, okay, hop over to the Xbox store, download it, play it. Rich, here's the thing. Last week we were talking about cloud gaming and I, you know, I expressed my viewpoint, but you know what? A show like this, this is a perfect use case for cloud streaming. Uh, where it's like, you know, developer wants to share a game with somebody, set up a build uh, and, you know, you tap into one of these cloud services and allow people to sample it without them actually having to download anything. Like, why would you not want to do that? That's That seems so, like, awesome. What about like a vertical, sl a vertical slice streamable to your, you know, to your, you know, local device? Like, oh, we just played the first 10 minutes of Grand Theft Auto 5 next gen or whatever. 
and then they're they're still in control of it you know they can it's it's not like the files are necessarily out there for the public and i feel like there's a lot of potential there for like showcasing stuff to people remotely and i would love to see that so uh, actually um, i've just received some news which is uh, as we film this under embargo but won't be under embargo by the time uh, the direct goes out and apparently microsoft is uh about to announce it's in the final stages of updating its data centers around the world with the Xbox Series X silicon. Okay. So, oh, so um, no more Xbox One in there. Well, there might still be oh, Xbox yeah. One in there, you know, basic, basically as a fallback. But I think <laughs> the, the point is that now they can actually uh, deploy Series X uh, experiences <laughs> as streamable. I think that's actually quite a potent Or they thing. could run three or four Xbox One instances on a single Series X. Yeah, yeah which is just, again, <laughs> phenomenal. So these, the, the server version of the Xbox Series X, that is the full chip with double the RAM, or what is it? Um, it's, the, it's the same chip that's in the Series X. Uh, the RAM situation isn't clear, but it wouldn't surprise me if it does have more RAM. It also wouldn't surprise me if there were some tweaks to clocks and whatnot, because cloud streaming inherently has a, a specific overhead on top of that so for example the xbox uh one s uh, cloud servers have an overclocked cpu um, which uh, the retail unit doesn't so there might be some tweaks there but um just fundamentally the ability to bring uh series x level experiences to anybody with a with a stream capable device is actually quite a potent marketing tool and um, i'm really curious to see what they do with it john Namco apparently trademarking or resurrecting trademarks for all of the Ridge Racers. I saw that Rave Racer and Ridge Racer, among others, were uh, registered. And that is like, uh, man, I dream that they do something with this because I miss Ridge Racer stuff. Like if it, you know, obviously I'd love a new entry and but Rave Racer has never been brought home officially. Uh, emulating it doesn't feel quite right. I found because you know That's it's designed for a steering title, wheel. Not? Yeah, it's an arcade okay, game. Yeah. Uh, so my dream would be like, hey, what if they finally like they've had Namco Museum around for decades, right? And it always focused on their older 2D stuff, which was awesome. You know, Namco Museum launches in the mid 90s. It makes sense to look back at that. But I feel like now is the time for like Namco Museum 3D, so to speak, or like you know. It's like, all right, we're moving on. Everything 3D is going into this new Namco museum. We're going to have like the Ridge Racer uh, museum or something, you know. If they could just bring all of those original arcade, arcade titles home in a really nice way, uh, that would be amazing. Because, again, we've never actually had arcade perfect conversions of those games at home and have had to rely on not perfect emulation uh, for all of them. So, like, just... That would be like such a killer, wonderful thing to happen at E3 if it were to happen. But, uh, and it would show that maybe Namco is actually looking back at some of their old stuff and thinking like, you know what, we should, uh, we should actually bring some of this stuff back because there is a hole missing there. Like Namco's output during like, you know, the PS1 and PS2 generation was just unbelievably off the charts. They were just cranking out so many amazing games. And maybe, you know, Tekken 7 and Ace Combat 7 are both really good. They were very well received. They sold very well. So maybe they're starting to think about bringing some of that stuff back again. So we can only hope. Well, that's your dream, John. My dream <laughs> is that you do a DF Retro on Ridge Racer 6 and 7, mm. oh, uh, which, okay. which were the launch launch titles on Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. Oh, yeah. Do you know a, lot, a lot in common and a lot to separate them. Okay, and I like I this think, idea. I think, that, I think that would be awesome. And also, it was kind of bizarre because I think um, the Xbox 360 game ran at 810p. Yeah, it was Some over reason. 720. Yeah. <laughs> but you, you couldn't initially see that because it was, you know, but I think maybe, I don't know if it's like internally rendering that way or if you output 1080p, you actually get a countable 810. I, th I think it actually scales down and then scales up so that the, the gain isn't really uh, isn't really there. But um, yeah, that's just that's just something that's just sort of popped into my head because I really I mean, basically, if we think about it, Ridge Racer 7 was the last proper series entry. Yeah, I mean, they tried again on 3DS and Vita, but uh, those weren't the best. No, those were the games. 
And I actually thought the 360 one was quite interesting as well. I, uh, I, was, I had a roommate back in 2006 when I was playing Ridge Racer 6 like crazy, and he worked the night shift. Uh, and I had the TV up against his bedroom wall and like, I had the Hey Hachi like announcer on that. And I swear to God, he's like, comes out. It's like, would you stop playing that damn game? <laughs> I'm trying to sleep. <laughs> and it's just like, yeah, whoops. I can imagine that being annoying. <laughs> uh, obviously we had the 3070 Ti come out. Um, Ty, NVIDIA. Ty, Rich. Um, Ty, yeah. <laughs> Wait, no. yeah what? Well, this is a, <laughs> what this is a really call? interesting discussion. There's Ti and Ty. And uh, actually, you know, the discussion is which one is real, which one is the proper pronunciation. And um, basically, within NVIDIA, they basically say either. But I understand that Ty is short for titanium. Please. <laughs> <Look at> oh. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, it's also, I think it's borrowing it from the periodic table of elements. But when you say the periodic table of elements, you don't say Ty, you say T-I, right? Don't you? I don't know. <laughs> Whatever. <sighs> uh, I, I think mean, they, should, um, they should rename it to the 370, 3070 Ty, like extreme Merc <laughs> edition or something, you know. <laughs> 319 The Merc. evil commando mercenary extreme. <laughs> Uh, well, this is the thing, isn't it? The uh, I think what's definitely lacking is we can talk about TIs and ties, but um, back in the day when a GPU was marketed as the evil commando, this is like, this is the way forward. I mean, we are seeing some shades of it returning with the um, <laughs> the, the Merc Speedster. <laughs> the Merc Speedster. Uh, <laughs> the ex Merc Speedster. It isn't, it, isn't, it isn't dark or sinister enough to compare with the evil commando. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> but uh, 3070 Ti uh, as a product, um, the value price versus performance wasn't there. The CUDA cores weren't there to produce a, a, a meaningful boost to, to the experience. And it's kind of difficult to to sort of justify a new product when you know the 3070 is so good, and maybe those dies that were kind of left over as top end dies should have just gone out as 3070s. Um, it's 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 not a positive move, I don't think, and um, it's just a kind of a weird situation with with GPU launches at the moment where. You know, basically everybody, it doesn't seem to matter whether the product is good or bad. You've just got to grab it while one is actually physically available. And, you know, this is leading to some really bizarre stuff. Like I, I can't see any kind of um, argument for the pricing on uh, the, uh, ten, no, the 3080 Ti, you know, when you're getting like, you know, maybe 10, 12 percent more than the 3080, but you're paying like hundreds of dollars more. But, you know, people are buying them because the alternative is a scalped 3080 at two thousand, two and a half thousand dollars $2,500. It's just crazy stuff going on at the moment. I, I guess, you know, we're kind of entering the dust discussion we had last week where it's like, OK, well, what can we do about it? And the answer is at the moment, not uh, a I, whole I just, lot. Coming off your 3070 Ti review as well as your 3080 Ti review, I'm just longing for the days when the spread... I, th I think AMD did it better this time, at least, uh, even though there, you know, there's some things in there where I just wonder like, oh, is the GPU actually that great? Um, but they have a better spread of like how many yeah, SMs they have, how much VRAM they have, and the price, uh, you know, the price has gone up on AMD's side as well too, but I don't understand the price of the 3080 Ti or 3070 Ti. They just, they're not hitting those new, they're not hitting that like, this is the threshold for an extra 200 USD. This, this is definitely not it, so yeah. Well, it's to the point now where um, in terms of price versus performance, gaming laptops are suddenly looking a whole lot more appealing. <laughs> that was because you, you, can, oh, yeah. you, can actually, you can actually buy those you can get them. RP. That was never yeah. the case. That was when I would always have friends ask me, I really want a gaming laptop. I'd be like, you could invest that same amount of money and get a PC with a GPU that's like almost three times as powerful. But that is just terrible. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm still waiting to get the 3050 Ti, which um, on, which is a laptop part, which I'm really curious to see, just to see, you know, because I honestly think that DLSS is an absolute game changer for low power GPUs. We've been waiting for the replacement for the venerable 750 Ti for, you know, almost a decade at this point. And I, I feel like it's time. I'm feeling lucky about this one. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, so I wanted to talk quickly about the Unreal Engine 5 work that you did, Alex. 
which uh, I thought was amazing. And uh, I was actually quite amused to see that the um, the bit rates required for the <laughs> DF.net downloads were huge. 90, 90 megabits per second yeah. uh, to, to, act, to accurately capture the quality of, of, the, of, the, of, of the nanite and lumen technologies there. It's just astonishing. Uh, I guess I've got a couple of questions, though. Um, first of all, I mean, obviously, we've seen how it runs on um, a relatively sort of mid-range uh, GPU, but you actually ran it on a Razer laptop with a mobile RTX 2070, which is basically uh, performance-wise equivalent to a 2060, but with more VRAM. So how did that go for you? That went really, really well. Um, I essentially loaded up the demo. Uh, initially, when you load it up, and I said this in the video, and I probably should have even stressed it much more, but when people look, you're putting posting these videos online, you should not play it in the editor, and you should uh, at least run it once, because the game is not doing any caching at all because it's not a shipping product. It doesn't have that set up. So it's going to run terrible the first time you run it. But you know, second time I ran it on this laptop after running through it at least once, I locked the frame rate to 30 FPS, ran it at 1080p since that's the laptop screen, and got a flawless 30 FPS throughout the entire way with, I think, maybe one or two frame drops when the golem drops. And that's, uh, well, I think the demo is not exactly optimized around that area anyway. Um, but that's kind of amazing. Uh, and it shows really. I think that even lower end Turing GPUs will do rather fine in Unreal Engine 5 based titles uh, in the upcoming future. I'm just curious, after coming out of this video, I am really curious about how they're going to scale games to 60 FPS because I think the visual quality at their internal 1080p uh, TSR to 4K is pretty good. Uh, but getting that up to 60 FPS was monumental. It was not technically even doable after all the trying I did. I'm pretty sure every GPU out there is going to drop frames below 60 when the golem falls. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I do really wonder what is going to be changing in the engine so that developers can more easily target um, 60 FPS while maintaining most of this feature set because this generation has already shown so well uh, that developers like 60, people playing games on console like playing 60, most games are going to allow for modes targeting that. But based upon what I saw, it almost seemed like their, their highest quality scaling scalability mode in the demo they had at least uh, did not win back enough performance to make me think, oh yeah, that could be a 60 FPS game. So Yeah, I've got a couple of other questions. Uh, first of all, what what is low quality? I mean, we talked about epic. We've talked about high. What is low quality on on that demo? So uh, after the medium quality setting, uh, well, at, well, when you activate the medium quality setting for what is called effects SG effects that controls lumen, and that literally just turns lumen off. So every shadow is pitch black. You there is no medium setting with lumen at all. So. That's not that's really it. usable then at that, that point. That's not at all usable. So at that point in time, uh, either they would, um, they recommend, for example, as part of their, uh, on, on this little Wikipedia wiki entry that uh, for GPUs that cannot run at least that setting, they recommend combining uh, image-based sliding uh, with SSGI and uh, some form of larger scale AO. So it could be side distance field AO, it could be ray traced AO, I guess, too, um, or something like that. But they, they recommend a completely different lighting model. And that, that's why I feel like you're either making a game utilizing Lumen or not. And you should kind of make that decision early on. It feels like it would be such a hack to try to stick all these other solutions into a game arted up around using, you know, Lumen's real time GI. And I just don't see a good case for that necessarily. I don't know. That, that's a weird one. I mean, I guess theoretically, and you know, it's like, hey, we have this awesome looking game on uh, PS5 and Xbox Series X. How about we bring it to Switch? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, they, they, they could do that. Um, Nanite <laughs> seems very scalable in comparison, even though in the demo, and I pointed out, Nanite is much more expensive in this demo than it was in the last one. Um, one of the things that I'm thinking about for scaling, because they don't really have a medium setting right now, is right now, even when you go down to what is called high, it is still running Lumen Reflections and Lumen Indirect Diffuse Lighting, because GI is made up of specular lighting and diffuse lighting. And I'm thinking they could probably turn off, for a lower setting than that, they could turn off uh, the reflection, Lumen Reflections, and instead just use SSR and uh, 
probably image-based lighting, so cube maps. The game would look probably pretty different in some areas, and it may lead to some development woes, because once again, you're supporting two different lighting models, uh, even with Lumen indirect diffuse. I I'm thinking they need more scalability settings in Lumen at the moment, because right now it is so heavy, and I don't see the ability to target 60 FPS very easily uh, for most of the content. It was pr it's pretty, it's, it's, you know, like the demo, you look at it, um, it's gorgeous, but there's actually not too much happening uh, on the screen. It's just really gorgeous static geometry, but there's not a lot actually happening. So I've got a couple more questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, what kind of storage uh, bandwidth does it use? Because obviously you were running it on a PCIe um, 3.0 SSD, a fast one, but it didn't seem to me that storage was any kind of bottleneck. Storage was definitely not a bottleneck here. There's only, uh, I mean, two moments in the demo when you can see storage being actively utilized, and that's when uh, you transport through the gate. Uh, and at that moment in time, I had numbers here, but basically when you go into the gate, uh, the amount of VRAM and system RAM being used goes down by about one gigabyte, just about, and then rapidly scales up to being full again, to being like, say it went down from four to three and back up to four. That's essentially, it's like exchanging out about one gig of data in that moment in time. And that's when I noticed it actually happening. But other than that, a little bit, uh, it started streaming a bit when you get around the golem. But I think the technology here and it's a bit of a misnomer the way they originally showed it because they showed it on PlayStation 5. And uh, then there was, you know, interviews with Tim Sweeney after the fact with uh, them talking about how, uh, you know, uh, next-gen consoles can run, or at least in the context there, the PlayStation 5 can run this. But they, they emphasized heavily that the SSD in the console, like the input-output there, the I.O., was key to enabling this demo. But when you play it on PC, you can see that actually, no, it's, it's more like a a VRAM and a RAM thing. And it wasn't using that much of that either. Like at the most 4.7 gigabytes of VRAM on a 3090 and um, just a little bit under or about four gigabytes of system RAM. So it is very scalable technology and it doesn't seem to require um, heavy amounts of uh, streaming capability. I guess the one thing you would see like any virtual texture system like we saw back in Rage back in the old days is that uh, if you don't have fast enough uh, 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 what is it called, bandwidth, uh, storage bandwidth, then you'll see active paging. You'll see really low res textures, or in the case of Nanite, you would see lower res geometry uh, come in later, but it shouldn't affect the frame rate. And my final question, uh, people seem to be suggesting that there was actually a reduction in detail compared to the first UE5 demo. And obviously the console warriors were coming out saying, oh, it's because it was oh, PS5 no. bespoke. <laughs> and uh, this had to be downgraded for right. multi-platform. Uh, um, what do you make of that? I, 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 can, I don't even have to say my own opinion of this. I can just quote what Epic said on their Nanite uh, presentation. With uh, It was a stream. It was really wonderful. Brian Karras uh, came on and talked about Nanite, as well as one of the uh, um, lead artists at Quixel, whose name is escaping right, right now. But basically, yes, there's aspects of the demo where uh, texture detail is definitely lower than you might have seen in the initial demo. Uh, and that's because instead of shipping unique normals and uh, unique detail textures, I think they're called, uh, for each asset, uh, they used tiling detail textures and tiling normals, which depending upon the size of an object and actually uh, how much space it is taking up in screen space, it doesn't say actually whether or not uh, the texture quality is better or lower. It's it's a very subjective thing at that point in time, um, but definitely over you know over a wide range of objects, you could definitely see that there would possibly be lower texture de detail as a result of that. Uh, but the reason for them doing it, and they said it in this um, uh, kind of uh, stream, was that they are already shipping. When you download the demo right now, it's or I should say the project demo, it's 100 gigabytes because it's including all the raw assets and everything you need to do to have this demo. And there's, I think, I forget, maybe 25 or 26 mega scan assets in it, maybe more, probably more actually. Um, and those are huge uh, files on their own before they become compressed on disk when you export the project. But they wanted to make sure that uh, it wasn't like even larger. So they cut out 
all the uh, bespoke textures and used a procedural element to do it. But uh, that's the reason why. It's about distributing it on their EGS platform and using bandwidth and not about because uh, you know, it requires some sort of PlayStation 5 level SSD, which of course, in that same stream, uh, uh, Brian Karras showed off the demo that when we saw in the initial PlayStation 5 running on PC, uh, very much so on purpose. He was, he was very adamant about debunking a lot of uh, Nanite skeptics, which I kind of found, it, it would be something that I would want to do actually if I was working on this project. Be like, no, it actually works. What are you talking about? <laughs> Okay, I think that rounds up uh, the discussion that we've uh, got lined up for content this week. And we're actually running a bit over time, but let's move on to some um, uh, user questions from the DF Supporter Program. Okay, so a few questions here. Um, wow, this is a big one from Matthew Santa Maria. With Stick Drift being present in the dual sense as well, do you think we will see the companies move to a more modular design, similar to how the Joy-Cons connect via ribbon cable when it comes to analog sticks, rather than having to resolder them in order to swap them out? Or is that something that would cause a rise in manufacturing costs? I wonder what the scale of the drift is and how much it's costing them in warranty fixes. My launch dual sense is currently at Sony's repair facility and I'm stuck playing PS4 games until it's back. I'd love to be able to swap out my sticks myself without needing to resolder. Sony also leaves the shipping costs to the client. So I'd be so it would be cheaper to do it myself anyways. Cost me around 13 bucks to send in. John. Uh, I don't have a lot of confidence that they would change that because I don't really think they want users messing around in there, to be honest. Um, but that is extremely frustrating. And I don't like the way current pads are built makes them much less uh, user repairable. Uh, it's still possible, of course, but it, it takes a lot more effort. I've run in... And it, I'm really frustrated with all the stick drift stuff that's been happening. Uh, it's plagued the switch since the beginning and it's, and nothing has really been done to fix it. Uh, can it be fixed? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's obviously a problem on the PS five now as well. Uh, my son went through three Xbox controllers. I don't know how, but They've all ended up with, with stick problems. It's the same problem. The stick drifts. It doesn't work correctly. Like certain, And repairing it's just kind of a pain. Uh, and it's it feels like these controllers are becoming more and more fragile, which makes sense considering their complexity. But uh, I am concerned about that. And I really, I, I'd imagine we'll see the usual like internal modifications over time you know they're always tweaking hardware to improve both the, the efficiency the ease of manufacturing reduce the bill of materials all this kind of stuff but i don't think that they're ever going to consider like hey let's make this more easily user repairable because fundamentally they don't want users in there mm. yeah i think uh from my perspective what kind of frustrates me a little bit is the is the denials yeah exactly uh, there's, you know, it seems to me that an issue comes up. A lot of people corroborate that there is an issue, and then basically we sort of get gaslighted by the platform holders. Say, "Oh, nothing going on here," you know, when obviously, you know, when obviously there is something going on, and it's and it is a bit of an issue. And the thing about the controller is, I mean, it's it's your actual interface to the game. If it's not working, you can't play games. So, you know, this whole issue needs to be resolved. And um, I guess at least in the case of uh, our supporter here, at least Sony's repairing it. But, um, you know, what if it was outside the warranty period? Also, I, I mentioned this things like my son's controller is breaking. One of those controllers was a special custom one that he picked all the colors for. He has his name on it and everything, and he loved it. And it doesn't work right now. The sticks are broken. And I know kids can be rough on this stuff, but that really bothers me a lot. And I don't know. I... I'm really sad to see how how poor some of these controllers are in terms of holding up. At the same time, it just seems like some people are rougher on them. Like I have never had this happen to any of my personal controllers. Like all of my PS4, Xbox, Switch stuff and older, uh all of those work perfectly still. So I think it's just some users are rougher on them, but it's happening to enough people at this point that it's uh 
it's very, very frustrating to see. And you're right. The companies just seem to be unwilling to acknowledge it. I mean, it's really bad on the Switch, apparently. And Nintendo, I don't think, has ever actually come out and said anything about it. Alex, is there such a thing as mouse drift in the PC space? I, yes. Uh, no, but mouse up. Well, yeah. I've never had mouse drift, technically. Well, it's more like you can have issues with the with the sensor for I, these. I, and yeah. I've definitely had that, too, where like a sensor just starts to go kind of messing up on you and you get the cursor starts to skip and act weird and you can try to clean it and but that that's a totally different thing i i, I think the most common uh thing that happens with mice is double clicking where the the sensor gets touched and it thinks it touches once or twice in this period when you hit it at a once or twice when you meant to do that it does the opposite of what you want that's something that i've happened uh i've replaced at least two razor death adders with that uh, in my life and i haven't also, used a razor death adder since wait, sorry sorry what, what's your mouse called the death adder the death this, adder uh, well, maybe uh, hold on a minute here yeah, we've maybe we've moved on from like the the crazy dark maybe conventions it used to be gpus and yeah. now it's mice it's mice well, yeah. I mean, a, a mice a mice a mouse is a simple interface it's a kind of you know it, it, even the name it's a mouse it's not in any way threatening but I, yours I, is called I death used to ad, I used to have a one ad, uh, death ad, uh, I had one that was called the black mamba mamba yeah <laughs> but I've since switched to the Logitech G900 which is comparatively yeah. a boring name but the G900 I've had that thing for years now and uh it is a very good mouse <laughs> same I'm, I'm using the Logitech G700s uh which can go wireless if you want, but I haven't used that in a long time. Uh, well, you know, maybe there's a gap in the market here. Maybe Razer is showing the way. We could have, we, we could launch our own peripherals. You know, you know, the digital foundry nuclear disaster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, the, 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 the digital foundry Chernobyl. I don't even know. Terrible. You know, the, the digit- <laughs> Wait, uh, what? The, the digital <laughs> foundry global aqu- apocalypse. What about your headphones, yeah. there, Alex? What are those called? I don't remember. I saw the package up there. I, I don't. I don't. It has to be something related to death and destruction, though. I just. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. We do see in the PC space uh, where you know um, MSI seem to be uh, labeling their motherboards uh, according to, according to uh, sort of weapons grade uh, uh, machinery, and uh, you were pointing out <laughs> what was the tweet you did the other day? What was it me? Yeah, it was where basically there was, uh, it, was it like a mortar product, an MSI oh, yes. mortar? And it just, yeah, there was you the said, M- actually. The, the, the MSI bazooka, and they show like a, a Soviet, oh. bazooka is a World War II uh, rocket <laughs> launcher. It's actually a rocket missile launcher, I think. Um, but uh, then they show a rocket propelled grenade. You know, I don't know what intern did that art, but they need to get they need to get a different job. That's see. That's what I guess we can that. open up the market for the Panzerfaust. You know, <laughs> I love that. I mean, that's also an RPG. Um, but Gu- guaranteed to make your opponents go Alfred is <laughs> I actually like that. Uh, but we'll yeah, MSI also calls their their RGB editing tool the Armory. I think is it or is it yeah. is that Asus? Right. I don't remember. Right? Uh, yeah, Asus have the uh, of the armor crate, I believe. But, yeah, the arm. Armor crate. I mean, this is all sort of pretty awesome, isn't it? I mean, it's uh, it's the inclusivity angle that I'm loving. It's just like you're 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 playing games here, so basically you're interested in a high end military, military weapon. Yeah, it's overlapping yeah. fields, you know, always has been. <laughs> So, yeah, I'm going to look into this as a potential business opportunity, you know, extra revenue stream for Digital Foundry, where, you know, we have to tap into this this new zeitgeist. <laughs> okay, look, let's move on. Uh, a contentious question here from um, Kevin, no last name. Uh, does it really matter if games are next gen right now? I think games scale so incredibly well. Seems like the controversy that a game might be cross-gen is a little bit overblown, not to mention the scarcity of the new consoles makes it even harder to justify the generation gatekeeping at the moment. I know we'll get there, and there's untapped potentials for be and there's untapped potential for being exclusive for to next gen, but console cycles are long these days, John. Yeah, so I I think he's he does have a good point. There there's certainly many games where it doesn't ultimately matter that much and i think we've always kind of said that you know 
it, it all comes down to what the, what the game is trying to do. I guess really the only thing that's changed this time is that usually first party games from all manufacturers would try to leverage the hardware in interesting ways and would kind of serve as like a showcase piece as to what you might expect from that generation going forward. And that's always kind of been the case uh, until this gen. And I think course, that yeah. specifically is what's missing because there, there has been cross gen in the past, even going way back. Uh, in fact, um, but you know, it's, mm. it's interesting like that, but like you look at what happened like last time we saw a lot of third party games launching on PS3 and 360 in addition to the, the then next gen consoles but they were often launched in heavily compromised form. I mean, I think the Shadow of Mordor uh, PS3 version is still kind of our favorite go-to for its, like, runs at, like, 10 to, 10 to 14 frames per second and missing half the features. And it's just, it's basically, like, an unplayable tech demo. Uh, it's <laughs> really, 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 really bad. But it's still it's still there. I don't think we have to go that far anymore, but um, it really just comes down to the first-party stuff. There's no... It doesn't feel like we have many developers that are trying to lead the way and showcase like, oh yeah, here's what we can do. I mean, Ratchet and Clank is one of the few that I think feels like it was made that way. Mm. Yeah, I think to be fair, there are some um, situations where cross-gen can work. I mean, if we look at um, Spider-Man, uh, Miles Morales, uh, I don't think you were shortchanged in getting a really great PlayStation 5 experience uh, because the game existed on PlayStation 4. But what they did was they they put specific work into leveraging the PlayStation 5 features in there. They didn't just, you know, increase resolution, frame rate, and texture detail. They they put extra effort in to make it something that became an event for the launch. So I think that's kind of the difference, really. I mean, cross-gen is a reality. And, the, and to be fair, there is a lot of commonality between this generation and the last in the way that we've not seen before. Um, but, at, but at the same time, um, the key stuff that was being sold to us uh, was the faster CPU, the storage, and how games are going to be different because of it. And um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a situation where that hasn't been fully developed. One aside thing, though, I've noticed a lot of people like thinking about next generation releases as like gatekeeping somehow. And I am a little bit confused as to when that mentality started because I don't feel like this was ever something that was discussed before for like every other console generation where it was like you just expected that a new machine would bring with it new experiences. But now it's like, oh, well, we can't have that, can we? Uh, but like, what's the I guess what's the point of these new machines if not to offer something new? And it's like. I in the past I was not getting new consoles on day one necessarily, and I th I thought that was okay. It was like something to look forward to when you did actually get it, and it was made it made that purchase a lot more impactful in the end, rather than just like otherwise. Right now, it just feels like you're just buying like a new video card, which is not to say it's a bad thing, but it has that same feeling. You know what I mean? Where it's like you get the new console. Hey, I just upgraded my GPU. You're still on the same system, but uh, you know. Uh, but again. I, it's just me rambling. It's my old ways shining through, and everybody's probably rolling their eyes by now. So, <laughs> no, you're entirely right, John. In that, you know, if we go back to 2013, you know, Kill, Killzone Shadow Four came out on uh, PlayStation Four. Nobody was demanding a PlayStation Three version. You know, <laughs> it, it just didn't happen. People were kind of like really excited to see what Guerrilla had done with the new hardware. And um, you know, I'm going to say that it's not Guerrilla's best game but it sure is an astonishing technical showcase for the PS4. And to deliver that at launch, I think, is a, is a phenomenal um, I, accomplishment. I maintain itself. that game is better than people give it credit for. I think mm. fundamentally the, the problem there is that they shifted away, like previous Killzone games had been extremely linear Call of Duty-like extremely, experiences. Yeah. Walk down the corridor, shoot the bad guys, and you continue to do that. With uh, Shadowfall, they tried to open it up a lot more and make it slightly more nonlinear maps. And I almost would feel like they were trying to tap into what Crisis had done a little bit. Like there's a lot of Crisis inspiration in the way that the game works. But it's also, it's not the best at communicating necessarily what you need to do at all times. And I think that probably frustrated a lot of people. Like, well, I'm in this place. Where do I go? What do I do? I just want to shoot guys. 
and there wasn't always guys to shoot. You actually had to walk around. And (laughs) I thought that made it interesting and kind of unique at the time. But uh, I guess the audience that had previously liked Killzone really didn't like that shift. And uh, it's generally looked back poorly upon. But I mean, come on, like, and when there are somewhat uh more constrained levels they're still more non-linear but like the idea of that, that that space station where you're like zero gravity the space station is hurtling towards the sun and you're like trying to find this like research subjects and it's like you know just the concept of what is happening there like shooting out those like uh skylights to let the sunlight in when you're close to the sun and because you're so close it like burns everything in its path you know just there's a lot of really neat ideas in there and uh I do think it's worth revisiting and looking at again. Absolutely, yeah. Um, there's a really interesting question from Stephen Thornhill here, but I think I'll leave that one to the end. Um, this one from uh, Jonas. Jonas. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Jonas. Jonas. Yeah. Jonas Tag. It's Tagizade. Tag- Tagizade. Tagizade. Maybe. This is, you know, fumbling with uh, surnames is your forte, Alex. Yeah, it is. Uh, Alex. So uh, <laughs> I'm, joining, I'm joining you on this one. Uh, actually, his question is to whom it may concern. Alex, in brackets, just got a 30 t- 3080 Ti. Good for you. And I am seeing an incredible 30% uplift in the Metro Enhanced Edition benchmark versus my old 3080, compared to around 13% in other games. Do RT cores scale much better in performance with the number of cores compared to CUDA cores? No, not really. So I'm thinking here that the benchmark is maybe, other than a bug, um, I'm thinking that the benchmark could maybe stress one part of the GPU because the SM difference doesn't uh, line up with that. But you are getting more, you know, what, two gigabytes more memory. And I can't remember, it's like two in the realm of almost 200 uh, more gigabytes per second memory bandwidth. So maybe it's stressing a bit more of that bandwidth or memory angle. So that's why you're seeing a higher uplift there. But other than that, I think uh, that's an anomaly. And I would be curious to see the actual data there. <laughs> yeah, we should take a look at that for sure. Yeah. It does seem, uh, because I actually really like the benchmarks that throw up the uh, the kind of weird results because you kind of investigate why it's happening. Mm-hmm. It could have implications for other games. So we'll check into that. We one. will. Yeah. Um, but let's move on to the next one, which I think is 100% for you, John. My question is for uh, is from a retro gaming perspective. Uh, this question from Jonathan G R. Um, how can I achieve a 480i output from a PS4 so I can pass it into a Retro Tink 2X Pro, which doesn't handle 480p output? Does Does a 480p HDMI to 480i component converter exist somewhere? I like the look with the scanline mode, and I was wondering if it was possible uh, to, to to do it with this example, with Dark Cloud from the PlayStation Four, uh, PlayStation Store. Ah, uh, yes. So I don't understand the question. So okay. basically, he wants to he wants to convert 480p to 480i. Let me explain this, and it, this is less for the RetroTink 2X Pro and more for the 5X Pro, but the 2X can benefit as well. Essentially. A lot of us have been toying with this thing lately where you essentially take a modern source and you input it through one of these devices and then you can send that output to an old SD TV. Now, why would you want to do that? So a good a good use case for this. So let's say you play like a, a pixel art game. You play like Sonic Mania. You play any number of indie style games that are designed around that aesthetic. Uh, you can take, say, an HDMI-only device. You use a converter to convert the HDMI to component video. It'll output 480i to that, which will work for what he's looking for. Uh, in the RetroTINK 5X Pro, though, there's a feature where you, you basically input that, and then you output from the HDMI to another converter that converts that HDMI output to component video, and then send that to the PVM or any other video monitor. And then you tell the RetroTINK to do the 240p downscale. So you get actual 15 kilohertz 240p from an HDMI source. And for some games, this actually ends up working really well. And again, it typically is going to be like indie style pixel art games and the like. Um, But that's kind of the use case. But to do any of this, you need to find these devices. And if you look on RetroRGB, uh, I think Bob has actually listed a, a range of confirmed leg free converters that you can use to convert HDMI to component video. And those will do the job for you in this case. 
<laughs> There's not, literally nothing I can add to that. Uh, question from Doc next. Hello, team. How do you think PS5 and Xbox Series will fare this summer heat-wise? Um, well, that's a kind of interesting question. I mean, I used to live in the Middle East where I had a PS3, mm -hmm. and uh, it still works. This was a launch model, but the fans were like on maximum warp. Um, <laughs> as for how the consoles are going to work this summer, um, well, PlayStation 5, uh, it's just got a gigantic heat sink and a... Um, a pretty large fan. I think it's going to be okay, but I guess you know, with that and Series X, it's going to be just a question of watching to see what happens. I don't know what you think about this, John. I mean, I, I'm sure that these have been very well tested for heat case scenarios, but as we know, consoles get dirty, and uh, we've seen what happens with prior generations when they become caked with dust. Um, but I mean, you know, I suspect it'll be like anything else where most of them should be fine. Uh, an especially dirty unit where the fan is clogged could could actually run into issues with heat, I would say, uh, especially in the case of, I don't know, it's actually hard to say how either one would fare. The, the one that I think would actually be potentially struggle the most is weirdly the Xbox Series S, because I feel like that runs hotter than all of them together uh, due to its very small chassis. Like you put your hand over that thing and it is cranking out some serious heat. But at, the, but at the same time, we're just in a world where ele electronics run hot. Uh, when it's when it's summertime, my office room area tends to be much hotter than anywhere else in the house, and I have to use the air conditioner to keep up with it. Uh, like the PC I'm using, like uh, that 3090, and especially especially that i9 7960X. That thing runs like the sun. I'm using water cooling on it. I'm doing everything I can to keep it down, but it it generates so much heat. And then I got that G-Sync monitor for my PC, which I bought in the winter. And I only realized now, like, oh, wait, G-Sync monitors like this actually also generate way more heat than my prior panel. So that thing is hot, too. So, like, everything around you, man, uh, TVs, your game consoles, PCs, it's just the heat is coming off this stuff. But companies test for it. It's just a matter of keeping them clean. I think that's the key. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm more worried about the PC side of things yeah. as well, John. Yeah. I mean, I've got <laughs> I've got the 10980 XE, which is the 18 core. Oh Intel my gosh! Thing. And and <laughs> it's literally next to my leg at the moment, and I can already feel like a kind of uh, wave of heat here. And uh, yeah, I'm just kind of concerned that once the heat wave actually kicks in, it's uh, going to be like liquid hot magma. I'm just imagining uh, you like leave it on to encode a video overnight, and you come in the next day, and there's a hole in the floor like melting <laughs> through, and you find it downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I do have the case open now, oh, wow. was, uh, just to to sort of make things get a bit more ventilation in there. Wow! But yeah, I'm I'm kind of more worried about the PC side of things. Although going back to um, uh, Gamers Nexus uh, thermal analysis of the PS5, there seems to be a, a memory chip on the PCB that doesn't have particularly good cooling. So um, on the one hand, I'm not going to sort of uh, sort of call into issue Steve's work there because it's usually very, very thorough. But on the other hand, um, these consoles, before they go out, I mean, all, both Microsoft and Sony have learned some hard lessons in terms of poor engineering decisions in the past. So the concept that, you know, they're not aware of this stuff, that it hasn't been tested, that they haven't taken their consoles out into like Death Valley or whatever <laughs> to, to test them for uh, the, the sort of heat dissipation side of things. Um, doesn't seem to ring true, but again, we're just not going to know. The funny thing is, we're not going to know a until we see, you know, what it, what happens in a heat wave, and b the cumulative damage that happens over years, which was the main cause of the uh, red ring of doom on 360. I'm still thinking about the uh, the as yet to be enabled uh, add-on slot in the PS5 for the NVMe drives. Like the cooling system, the cooling setup for that is curious, and I'm not sure. I mean, those drives run really hot, right? And I, 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 I mean, I've always wondered if maybe they haven't enabled it yet, potentially out of concerns for that. Like, I, I'm sure it's been tested, but how well? And like, I, I don't know. Like, you just look at that little chamber in there, and it does make me worry. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's move on to the final question, and it's a, a nice one from Stephen Thornhill. Hey guys. With E3 2021 underway, I thought it would be a good time to ask you guys 
what your favorite memories are of E3 shows from the past. Do you think we will ever see the return of the E3 of old before the pandemic where tens of thousands of people can attend? I personally think it would be sad if we have seen the end of the show as it used to be. Uh, Alex, what do you reckon? Gosh. Your favorite E3 <sighs> moments. It's hard because it's been a while since uh, PC games <laughs> headlined the E3s. Uh, I guess uh, I really did uh, back in the day like the initial Halo 3 reveal as well as the Halo 2 reveal. I always liked the Halo games quite a bit. Um, you know, just like that musical sting and then showing the Master Chief again in, you know, rendering glory that you couldn't see before, even though they never got up to that original E3 demo uh, for, the, for the initial Halo 3 reveal. But other than that, I don't know. There's actually E3. I'm, I, always, I always get less, less, less excited around E3 these days than I, at least ever since the Xbox One and PS4 came around, so. You've, you've not actually been to an E3 in person, have you? I have not yet, but after hearing about John's experience, I'm not sure if I really want to go always. <laughs> Yeah, I guess we can talk about that. I mean, I, I, I've i been to E3. I don't really want to go again. I actually think you see less of the show um, by being there than just by looking at the coverage and the streams and whatnot. Uh, but it's all about the opportunities. It's all about, you know, going hands on, talking to the to the right people. That's that's re really what E3 is all about uh, for me. But uh, favorite E3 moments, John? Oh, uh, I mean, for classic E3 moments, I mean, the Metal Gear Solid 2 trailers kind of hard to top like that being shown for the first time like and that's that's something that can never exist again I think where you see you catch a like a look at something that looks so fundamentally unlike anything else you've ever seen and it's running at 60 frames per second to boot and you're just like how the heck is this like even real uh and it was it it was mind-blowing and the game did live up to that trailer in fact so uh, it was definitely a case where they didn't like spoil it. It actually got better because that original trailer was field rendered, so it was pretty jaggy. And the final game used a full frame buffer, so it had better image quality. Uh, but then also, I would say uh, the first big showing of Doom Three, uh, when they showed the full gameplay demo. That's that's a while ago. Yeah, gosh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. And then also, I think it was this, maybe a year later, but. Uh, that 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 demo for Half Life Two, uh, that first demo, uh, obviously it changed a bit since then. But when they first, like that was one of the the most exciting and interesting demos I've ever seen because like first it starts with Gabe like walking them through, just tech demoy stuff showcasing what Source Engine can do, and then they crafted like multiple different scenarios to show the gameplay they had in mind, and uh, it, it was just showing things that that you couldn't even imagine existing at the time. Uh, and even though they didn't deliver on all of that, Half-Life 2 is still a great game. But then, you know, in more recent times, you know, I've had some really good experiences at doing E3 coverage, of course. I mean, it's very hectic and tiring, but uh, one of the weirdest ones was that last Sony conference where they walked us through all those, like, you know, for The Last of Us and... They, they put us in like the, all these weird rooms and like shuffling the crowd to different areas. And it was one of the most baffling things I've ever been to. Uh, that was bizarre. Um, but, you know, ha had a really good time in 2019 with Audi, like him and I running around the show floor. Like he wasn't officially working with us yet, but uh, he was kind of tag teaming with me. And we were just going around, getting captured, talking to developers. And it was a very efficient and enjoyable time. <laughs> I th is that the one where I was actually there, but not there, where I was actually with AMD? On, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You, you, you were there for that. You came in a little yeah. early and you met us up that one day at the coffee shop. That's but, right. But then you were like, okay, the show's <laughs> about to start. I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm just here for NVIDIA yeah. and AMD. Uh, favorite E3 moments. Wow. I think I, I think I was actually at the first E3 with the Saturn, um, which was pretty good. I mean, I mean, you saw stuff like, um, Fighters Mega, no, it wasn't Fighters Mega Mix. It was um, that remix of VF One. That was Virtue there. Fighter that Remix. Was, yeah, and there was a bunch of Saturn stuff there. Um, but E Three was very different then. It was just basically um, uh, the summer CES show kind of remixed. Um, recent stuff, I don't know. I think um, uh, Sony did a pretty awesome job with the PlayStation Four E Three reveal that they did there. They took the momentum of their actual sort of um, PlayStation meeting event from February and actually built on it. 
and um, the whole thing that they did with the secondhand or used games thing was a, a massive crowd pleasing moment but it you know probably quite crushing for Microsoft but it, it was a genuine E3 moment um, beyond that I just really like the the hardware reveals and the game reveals and another one that sticks out to me is um the 2015 one that they did for PlayStation 4, where they had the Last Guardian, Shenmue 3, and the announcement for Final Fantasy VII Remake. Like, that was just insane when that happened. Uh, and I actually think all all three of those projects turned out pretty good in the end. Uh, but specifically, the way they opened the show with The Last Guardian, which was this game that was like people had been dreaming and hoping for for like a decade at that point. I mean, the last... or uh, Shadow of the Colossus had come out ex- like a decade prior to that showing, basically, and this thing had been teased as a PS3 game for so many years, and it just never actually worked out. And then when they brought it back, and it looked every bit as like interesting as I had hoped, uh, it was awesome to see. And uh, as for the other part of Stephen's question here, do you think we will ever see the return of the E3 of old before the pandemic? Uh, probably. Um, I'm just sort of. I'm kind of biased against uh, about this because um, the ESA, I think, have proven to be really uh, unworthy of holding such a, a big event. Um, in terms of some of the antics with their data protection stuff, it's to the point where we were considering boycotting any further um, attendance at E3 because you know they've just treated uh, not just media but basically anybody who was on their databases so shabbily. Uh, I think the actual concept of an E3 that we've got this year, which is basically, I think it's existing simply through the goodwill of the publishers. I don't see the ESA bringing any kind of value to it. What about that website? Yeah, what about that? (laughs) The website is just ridiculous. And, you know, it does, you know, there's... this week is supposed to be press week. I haven't found any kind of opportunity worthy of um, even the time I spent registering to attend E3. Um, and I honestly think that um, Nintendo have kind of demonstrated that you just don't need E3. You can do things on your own terms. You can actually synchronize with E3 if you want to, um, but you don't have to. I think Sony State of Play um, has been nothing short of a big success in terms of, again, just sort of dictating when you show stuff. You can show stuff when it's ready. You don't have to, you know, crunch to get a vertical slice ready for, you know, some date in June. Um, I guess the other thing um, while we're at it, while we're talking about state of play, is that typically we're seeing actual gameplay, which, you know, an extended gameplay as opposed to bite sized trailers and CG nonsense. Which I think is really good. Um, so, you know, do you think we'll ever see the return of the E3 of old? I'm not sure I want it to return, to be honest. Um, it's nice to have a rallying point for the industry. I think there's other um, shows that can it, do that, though. That's the thing. In exactly, other, yeah. Other and, opportunities. I gen- and I think, you know, although I think there, there's potential safety issues in terms of uh, crowding, Gamescom is much more of an interesting event from my perspective. Um but, you know, I personally think it would be sad if we have seen the end of the show as it used to be, uh, says Stephen. I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> that, that, that's that's, that's, that, that's that kind of the way to end it. You know? stuff yeah. oh. <laughs> on that particular <laughs> question. But I think we're going to wrap it up there. What are we looking at at the moment? Yes, yeah, it's uh, turning into quite a long uh, oh, my God. Uh, so... First of all, uh, thank you, uh, Alex, for joining me on this one. And I do love that vest. Yeah, it's uh, it's probably like 30 degrees Celsius in my room right now. So Wow. So I was, I'm suspecting that you'll be uh, throwing the windows and the doors wide open as soon as we finish up on this one. He finally gets to understand what it feels like to be a GPU. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm fermi hot right now, almost. So. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> And, and I spy, John, at the back there, you've got your uh, AC unit on at maximum warp. <laughs> yes, not at maximum warp, but it is on to keep it nice and cool in here. Because, uh, yeah, like it always, uh, all this hardware increases the temperature in this room dramatically. I've and, measured uh, it. This video, this video hasn't been brought to you by NVIDIA Broadcast. No. Uh, you are using it there. For the AI yeah, noise so hopefully it sounds all right. But I am trying to cancel out the sound of the AC unit using NVIDIA Broadcast. So... <laughs> 
We'll see. No, this episode is brought to you by Raid Shadow Legends. Wait, wait no, sorry. <laughs> it's really not. It's actually oh brought God. to you by Audi, who's going to be doing the editing. Thank you, Audi. Yeah. Thank you, Audi. And accelerating it because we need to get this one out early. But anyway, thanks for joining me on this one, guys. As usual, if you did enjoy the content, please like, subscribe, share. If you want early access to the DF Direct Weekly, join our Patreon. You know, that's that's what it's there for. There's some great stuff happening there. Lots of behind the scenes access to the team. Uh, lots of uh, bonus materials. DF Retro, it's bigger and better than it's ever been before. Uh, but that's all from us for now. Thanks for watching.